The second lecture is titled, Selection in Action. And now to introduce our program, the Vice President for Grants and Special Programs of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Peter Bruns. Welcome back to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, for our 13th Holiday Lectures in Science. Now over the years we've created we have a whole series of very interesting lectures, but we've created a lot of other uh, resources that go along with those. And we've put all of that material, the lectures, animations, virtual labs, and so on, on a special website called biointeractive.org. And I, I encourage you to, to go over to that website at some point and see what else is there, biointeractive.org. Our next speaker in this series is Dr. David Kingsley, an HHMI investigator from Stanford University. Uh, David is well known uh, in the scientific community for developing molecular tools to study natural populations of stickleback fish. But before he uh, talks about that sort of form of natural selection, David is going to first talk about selection as artificial selection uh, for a number of organisms, including, for example, the dog. Uh, so here is a, a short video to introduce David. I was interested in lots of things when I was in early school. I had loved dinosaurs as a kid. Most kids are fascinated by big bodies and interesting structures when they're small. From that time on, I was fascinated by shape and, uh, shape and morphology and, and vertebrate. So right now my whole lab works on skeletal development and we've used a variety of organisms to look at that. About seven or eight years ago we got very interested in trying to use the same genetic techniques that have been so successful in studying lots of other hard problems to study a really hard problem which is the genetic basis of vertebrate evolution. We ended up uh, having found uh, this small fish called the three-spined stickleback, which has undergone one of the most spectacular uh, evolutionary radiations on Earth. Lots of the interesting uh, populations can be found here in California. Uh, and that makes it possible to go fishing nearby, collect organisms that have undergone incredible morphological change in the last 10,000 years, bring them into laboratory, and actually look at the genetic basis of what has made them uh, what has made them different. A lot of people think evolution is just sort of this curiosity uh, uh, driven science and it's much more than that. A lot of uh, current medicine is based on what we know about evolution. So um, every time you're treated with antibiotics uh, because you have a bacterial infection, the uh, physician and you are facing an evolutionary arms race between the bacteria that's in your system, a drug that's killing the bacteria, and the bacteria's uh, attempt to evolve uh, to avoid the drug that's killing, uh, killing most of the bacteria. That's evolution. I hope that by the end of the holiday lectures, uh, people will have a new appreciation for both the diversity of living things, but at the same time, the common origin of, uh, of living things. Evolution is all around us. Evolution is what has generated the foods that we eat, the pets that we keep, the strategies for treating um, infectious disease uh, in, in the hospital. It isn't just a historical process. It's something uh, that continues all around us today and in the most relevant ways possible. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, Sean gave you a great introduction to both Charles Darwin and the idea of natural selection. Darwin originally coined the term uh, natural selection by analogy uh, to a process of artificial selection. It's well known uh, uh, by human breeders. Human breeders uh, take natural variants that occur all the time, choose uh, traits that they're particularly interested in, breed selectively from the plants or animals that show those traits and by doing so develop uh, new breeds that can look very different uh, from, from the original animals. Darwin and Wallace realized that a very similar process would happen uh, in nature. So wild plants and animals vary in all sorts of random ways. 
in uh, your planting and agricultural field. So how did ancient agriculturists achieve uh, these major transformations? Well, there's an archaeological record of corn. So you see the first evidence of sort of corn-like maize cobs uh, appearing maybe six to, six to 9,000 years ago. Those can actually uh, be dated. The earliest sites are in uh, southern Mexico near the sites uh, where wild teosinte grows. That's one form of archaeology. There's another type that can be done. This is genetic archaeology. Okay, so in an attempt to try to identify the key genetic events that are responsible for the major differences between teosinte and corn, you can actually today set up crosses between the original wild ancestor and today's uh, highly derived derivative. The plants are still so closely related to each other that you can generate fertile F1 hybrids. And in the next few slides, teosinte chromosomes will be shown in red, maize chromosomes will be shown in blue. So you cross these two different plants, and in the first generation, the F1 uh, hybrids, you'll have one teosinte and one maize chromosome for uh, every chromosome in the plant. If you intercross those uh, F1 hybrids to generate a grandchild or second generation, an F2 generation, you'll start to put together different chromosome combinations based on uh, uh, Mendel's laws. So as you all know from your genetics classes, for a simple Mendelian trait, you uh, typically will take from the hybrids uh, randomly either the teosinte or the maize chromosome, so a red type or a blue type in the uh, seeds and the pollen of each hybrid. You put them back together uh, during fertilization to generate uh, the F2 uh, grandchildren that are shown in the squares. A quarter of the offspring will randomly inherit uh, two teosinte-like chromosomes. Another quarter of the offspring will inherit uh, two maize-like chromosomes. So uh, in this grandchild generation, you're generating uh, different combinations that bring back together some of the chromosomes of the originals or uh, still a mixture of uh, maize and teosinte-like -like chromosomes. Okay, so that principle can be used to try to roughly estimate the number of genetic factors that underlie the major architectural differences uh, between maize and teosinte. So in the simplest possible world, if all of the differences between maize and teosinte were due to a simple Mendelian gene, you'd expect when you did one of these crosses that 25% of the uh, F2, the grandchildren plants, would look like either the maize or the teosinte parents. Okay, it turns out it's not that simple. Uh, so what would happen if the differences were controlled by two genes? So you had to have two different genes on different chromosomes together to produce the differences. Well then, instead of seeing maize or teosinte in a quarter of the offspring, you would see them in one quarter by one quarter, uh, or one sixteenth of the offspring. So that's the chance of getting two maize-like chromosomes at gene number one and two maize-like chromosomes uh, at gene number two, for example. Three genes, it gets even worse. A quarter by a quarter by a quarter is one sixty-fourth, four genes, etc. So the major conclusion from these kinds of tables is that if the genetic differences between forms are controlled by a large number of genes, it's very difficult to get all of the chromosomes back together in the right combination to regenerate the parental traits when you do this sort of uh, genetic crossing. So you're down to one in thousands if the traits are controlled uh, by, by uh, lots of genes. Conversely, if traits are controlled by relatively few genes, then you'll regenerate uh, parental-like phenotypes in a substantial fraction of the offspring, as many as 25% for a simple Mendelian character. Okay, George Beadle actually carried out a very large uh, cross of this uh, type. He raised 50,000 F2 grandchildren from a cross between maize and teosinte. And what he found was that about 1 500th of the plants looked like the maize or the teosinte parent. And that suggests something on the order between four and five genes that might be involved in controlling uh, the dramatic differences in plant architecture and, and, and seeds. So what are these genes? Well, geneticists can now do lots more than just calculate ratios. In fact, sophisticated uh, genetic maps have been developed for all of the chromosomes uh, in maize. You can do these sorts of crosses and isolate DNA samples from uh, each of the, uh, the F2 plants measure all of the traits in the plants, and then type those DNA samples with molecular markers that make it possible to monitor whether a given plant inherited teosinte-like or maize-like uh, uh, chromosomes for any marker in the genome. When you do that, what you find is that there are particular chromosomes regions that control particular aspects of uh, plant morphology. So there's a chromosome region that controls flowering, one for branching,